Welcome to Museum of the African Diaspora. My name is Elizabeth and I'm the Director of Public Programs uh, here and have the distinct honor of working with Brian Terry, our Chef in Residence. We're in our fifth year of the Chef in Residence program. Um, you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, in the conversation. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what's on your chairs. You have a What's Happening flyer that tells you about other programs coming up here at MOAD. Uh, you also have a survey. Um, if you could take a moment to fill out that survey before you leave today, I'd really appreciate it. It's very helpful for us um, in programming, learning about who our audience is and how the program impacts you. Um, so if you could fill that out, I'd really appreciate it. Um, it looks like you also have a postcard for Vegetable Kingdom. How many people are excited about Vegetable Kingdom? Yeah, yeah. woo! More than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Vegetable Kingdom comes out on Tuesday, February 11th. And today is Sunday, February 9th. So uh, you all are the first people in the entire world that have an opportunity to purchase this book and hold it in your hand after you purchase it. Wow. Uh, so make that happen, right? Um, uh, I definitely want to thank the De Young Museum. Renee's out here. Say hi, Renee. Um, today's, today's program is put on in partnership with the De Young Museum um, in conjunction with their exhibition, Soul of a Nation. Has anybody been out to the De Young to see Soul of a Nation? All right. It's amazing. Everybody in this room should go see it. If you haven't, it's open through March 15th. Um, we also had a, a jointly promoted or uh, presented program yesterday at the De Young um, with Erica Huggins about the Oakland Community School, which she directed for many years. Um, so yesterday, today, we're working together and we will continue to work together to promote black art. Um, so please support both institutions. I also want to take a moment to thank Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser is the lead sponsor for the Chef in Residence program and has been supporting it for the entire five years that it's been in existence. So we could not be doing these programs um, without the support of Kaiser. So is anybody a Kaiser member in the audience? <laughs> All right. Woo. Um, what about MOAD members? I'm gonna get, yeah. Somebody's going to raise their hand for something, right? All right. MOAD members, awesome. If you aren't a member of MOAD, please consider joining. Um, it's really important for us to build our membership base and know that people out there support the work that we're doing so we can keep doing it. Um, so now I would like to uh, officially begin the program by introducing the incredible Brian Terry. Uh, he is chef, cookbook author, um, social activist, educator, amazing dad, good friend, um, James Beard Award winner, uh, and he is just truly one of my favorite people to work with. So please join me in welcoming Brian Terry. Man, you know how kids are like brutally honest. I uh, came back from this hour-long hot yoga class this morning, and my daughter was in there, my five-year-old, and I pick her up. She's like, "Your breath." Oh. <laughs> we need to get that together. So, man, um, I mean, I got it together earlier, but I'm gonna consistently have this moment like cinnamon today. Um, so, thank you all for coming here. I'll say this. I'll start with this. Put me in a room full of thousand, uh, one thousand strangers mm -hmm. before you put me in a room with like a hundred people with whom I know a lot of people, because I'm shaking my boots right now, but it's all good. Um, give me some love, y'all, come on. So I'm playing two roles today, one as the chef in residence here at the museum, and second as a creative who will be in conversation with these two brilliant people, Savannah Shange and Erica Huggins. Um, I do want to tell people about the chef in residence program. Is, anyone, is this the first program that people have been to? The Chef Residence Program? Okay, so I'm going to tell you all a little bit about what we do. In 2015, Linda Harrison, our former executive director and leader, um, she discovered that I was an uh, artist in residence at Grace Cathedral here in San Francisco. And so she came to some of the programs that I was doing there, and she had this brilliant idea to bring me here to MOAD to create programming for the public. They were all centered around health, food, farming, and the like. 
And we've done some amazing things, cutting edge, brilliant. I like to say, if I can say that about my own program, um, you know, from intimate conversations with authors and um, signings, panels with farmers, scholars, cookbook authors, and journalists, dinners both here at the museum and next door at the St. Regis Hotel. We had the first, as far as I know, the first art, media, and food justice conference. And last uh, spring, we actually had a postpartum justice conference in which we talked about the um, critical issues that mostly black and native women are dealing with in terms of maternal mortality and, and infant mortality as well. So this has been a powerful space to talk about food. And, and, and this is, as I always say, one of the most important spaces in San Francisco, a city that has seen rapid out-migration of black people over the past decade or so. Um, we need spaces like this that are about us, that are about our stories, and that truly celebrate the diversity and complexity of black folks. Y'all feeling that? Y'all yeah. agree with that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so before I pass this over to Savannah, I actually want to lead us in a very short mindfulness exercise. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. So back in 2000, when I decided to commit to these issues, I um, was clear that I needed to go to cooking school because I wanted to have the skills to work with young people, to both teach them you know, these skills that they can take into their adult life, but also politicize them and help train them to be the ones who are kind of owning and driving the change in their own communities that are addressing food apartheid. So um, I didn't want to take out any loans, and so I was working full time, going to culinary school part time, and starting to structure this organization that would then become Be Healthy, this community-based organization that I um, that ran for five years, that worked with young people, mostly from the lower economic strata of New York. We'll talk about that in the conversation. But my ex-girlfriend at the time decided to move in with me in my tiny studio apartment in Brooklyn to help me cut costs. So. It was the dead of winter, she was living with me, and we were having serious cabin fever. And I decided that I needed to figure out a way to regularly get out of the house as much as possible because we were, we were having drama. A lot of drama, okay? I'm sure some of you might be able to relate to that. But um, what, um, what I decided to do is I actually um, joined this immersive um, yoga program. So it was like a six week, you know, for people who are kind of novices, this six week Nova, or six week yoga, um, training for you know people who are new to yoga and that program in addition to this mindfulness practice that I started to cultivate really helped me to tap into not only the kind of political and intellectual um, ways in which I should think about food and health and farming but how do you know how can I come from a hard place how does my spirit inform the work that I do and so I say all that to say that it continues to inform that. And one of the things that I'm very clear about is that um, we bring energy and vibrations to the food that we prepare and we cook, right? You guys familiar with this? Yes. Have you guys seen this film like Water for Chocolate? You kind of <laughs> expound upon that in the film. Like if you have like negative funky energy and you cook that food, then the people consuming it will probably be cons consuming that energy as well. And so um, when Erica Savannah and I were talking about what this conversation would look like, we were clear that we didn't want it to just sit in the heady intellectual realm, and we wanted it to be also about the heart space and about um, kind of the spiritual grounding that we all bring to the work that we do. So I just want to lead everyone in a very short mindfulness exercise that I often do. I'm not going to pretend like I always do it because, you know, life happens, things get crazy, you just got to get food on the table. But what I strive to do before I cook I take a moment to just check in with where I'm at, scan my body. If I'm feeling like, you know, off balance or negative energy, I really try to just like have a moment of deep abdominal breathing in order to help center and ground me before I go in the kitchen and cook. Now, trust me, there are a lot of meals that got all types of stuff in there, like olive oil, garlic, uh, white supremacists, kind of like her. <laughs> Uh, drama with my wife, you know, it happens, but I strive to do this most of the time that I'm going to the kitchen. So, what I want you to do, I'm going to count to three, I want everyone to close your eyes. I want you to take deep abdominal breaths, and we're going to do three of them, really simple. Breathing into your belly, as you breathe into your belly, your belly should expand, and when you're exhaling, it should contract. 
And what I like to do is I'll take four breaths on the inhalation and then eight breaths on the exhalation. So count to three and close your eyes. We're gonna all do this in unison. Y'all ready? Yeah. Are y'all ready? Yes. Do y'all need coffee? Yeah. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. Okay, how y'all feel? Y'all feel centered? Y'all feel grounded? Did y'all expel all that white supremacy? The white supremacy violence? <laughs> Thank you. Um, when we talked about this event, um, I the first person that I thought about moderating it was Savannah Shange. I've known Savannah for over a decade, and I feel like it's such an honor to get to know, like, I mean, I know people say things like this, but Savannah is seriously one of the most brilliant people that I've met. Um, she's multi-talented, actress, um, academic, teacher, activist, and Savannah has been a vegan for like 50 years now. <laughs> so we, we would often vibe when I could, you know, tell me you still yeah. Okay. So Savannah used to live with my wife. They had uh, they were housemates back in the day, and so I, I have had the pleasure of having a lot of Savannah's amazing vegan baked goods. And what I didn't know when I um, wanted to bring her on is that Savannah has a new book that came out in the last quarter of 2019. And so I thought it was so serendipitous and perfect that she's moderating because I have gotten a chance to read her brilliant book. Um, I don't even recall the full name of it. Um, can you tell, what's the name of it, Shannon? Progressive Dystopia. Well, I know that, what's the name? It's the subtitle. Uh, Anti-Blackness, Abolition, and Schooling in San Francisco. Progressive oh. Dystopia. Anti-Blackness, Abolition, and um, Schooling in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So uh, the book will be on sale downstairs, and she will be there to sign it, as well as uh, me signing Vegetable Kingdom, so please check that out. So I want to invite, Savannah and Erica to join us. Uh, I'm gonna read Savannah's bio. Savannah Shange is an urban anthropologist who works at the intersections of race, place, sexuality, and the state. She's assistant professor of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, with research interests in circulated and lived forms of blackness, ethnographic ethics, Afro-pessimism, and queer of color critique. How about that? Wow. So that is also going to introduce Erica Huggins. Uh, <laughs> so I had the, the honor and the pleasure of actually introducing Erica yesterday. We did an event at the De Young Museum and it was so important and brilliant. Erica recreated. So Erica is a former political prisoner. She is um, a poet. She's a mindful practi practitioner. She ran the uh, Oakland Community School, which was started by the Black Panther. It was the flagship of their um, survival programs. There were 65 survival programs that the Black Panthers had that were aimed at meeting the basic needs of people in community. Erica was the director of the Oakland Community School. And this model was cutting edge. It was child-centered. It was, you know, I, so, Savannah and I we were talking about this throughout the process of this, but, um, full disclosure, I send my children to a way too expensive private school in Oakland and I've become like kind of immersed in the independent private school world. Mm -hmm. And what so many of these schools are striving to do, the kind of pedagogical pedagogy that they're trying to implement, the Black Panthers were doing it way back in the 1970s. 
at the Oakland Community School. So, you know, there's so much, you know, I, I said that this, this, this thing that I've been hearing a lot, that we should give people their flowers while they're still here to smell them. We need to be uplifting the work of Erica and all the teachers and administrators and the people on the ground at that school because they were so ahead of the game. And um, I think it's a model that we can resurrect and we'll discuss that. Um, and I think we need to be looking towards these community run, community owned schools where people who look like the children are at the school, who care about them and who love them and who can teach them in only the way that those type of people can. So um, that's my introduction. And I'll pass it over. <laughs> For that because I mean when people say this person needs no introduction this is real that's they were actually talking about Erica Huggins if you look up this person's introduction you don't look next to it I mean from being enshrined in poetry rap songs that I grew up listening to like literally um the shadow like most shadows like make it hard for things to grow but yours is the kind of shadow that makes people have some respite from like the hard burn of, of white supremacy I'm so glad that is so powerful and has spread so far um, and so both of you really, though, have dedicated decades to not just black communities, right, but to a really broad sense of liberation that extends even beyond humans, right, to really sustaining life as we know it and as we need to come to know it. And our, our, our time here today is framed by this title of feeding the people. And so part of what I was wondering is thinking about when we say the people, how do we define that? I'm sure some, most of y'all are familiar with Ella Baker, yes, mm -hmm. movement legend. And one of her ways of organizing, Ella Baker would ask folks, who are your people, mm -hmm. right, in a way to both call in their commitments and also call in their connections to community. And I was thinking about starting our time here today with Ella Baker's legacy with that question, who are your people and how did you find your way to movement work? Well, as a little girl growing up in Southeast Washington, D.C., I actually asked myself that question a lot. Because I was taller than anybody in my sixth grade class, which meant I was the tallest girl in my school. So where do I fit? I kept asking myself. Who, who, I know my family's my people, but who else? And then I went to the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. That would be the March on Washington. And I was 15, and I stood there, and I saw all of these people who had walked, jogged, come in a church bus, a school bus, a hoopty truck, um, in church clothes and coveralls. And it made me feel so certain that these are all my people, but they weren't just black people. And I realized early on in my life that I don't fit into the box called female in a particular way. Like I was taught, don't don't cross your legs. Don't well cross your legs, don't sit with your legs open. Why? I would ask. What's that got to do with who I am? Don't sass me, girl. <laughs> um, and then I don't fit into that box called male. I don't. I fit somewhere fluidly along the way. But I had to come to that on my own because I couldn't talk to anybody about it. So who are my people? All the people I'm getting at it. Some kind of answer to your big question. All the people who've been pushed to the margins, pushed, forced, where spaces that are unkind have been created for them. And then when I was incarcerated, I got to see those people, my people, black and brown women, because they filled the prisons. And we talk about men, but black and brown women are the fastest growing population of incarcerated people. That's sad when we think about the children, and the children are my people. All children, I don't care what they look like and who their parents are or are not, I love children because they come 
from that space you were talking about, the heart. They're, they're, they're not yet trained to have a lot of over, overthinking BS going on. And if so, they're willing to open up and, and change. And so um, then I joined the Black Panther Party after, um, not too long after I was at the March on Washington, actually just a few years later. And we said, all poor and oppressed people are our people. And then there are really good people who don't fit in that category, poor, that are my people, for other reasons. And so I could go on and on and on, but what I want to say is humanity. And then the animals. And then the earth itself. And by the way, I want to ask permission from the tribal peoples of these United States, North America, for allowing us to stand and sit on their land. This is not, we are the immigrants to this land, unwilling, I want to say, many of us, but they are the people of this land and they are my people. So, long answer to a short question. <laughs> I think that's a great question, Savannah, and I'm going to start by naming my people, and then I'll kind of elaborate. So my people are my uh, grandparents, Rosalie Terry, Andrew Johnson Terry, uh, Edward Bryant and Marjorie Bryant. My people are, um, I think very specifically, the, the women and men who ran the Black Panther uh, survival programs. And my people are my children, and our children. I'm saying like my little children, but our children. And so I want to start by talking about because uh, you know over the, because I've been doing this work for so long, a lot of people don't know that my my work around these issues started in grassroots activism before I thought about writing a book. Before I thought about being the chef in residence at the moment, <laughs> I um, was working with young people in New York, and the way that that started was actually um, oh no, I'm skipping ahead. Um, I want to go back to my childhood. And I want to talk about being from a family who have agrarian roots in the rural South. Uh, my grandparents you know, had farms that they grew up on in rural Mississippi and Arkansas. And when they came to Memphis where I grew up, you know, clearly they brought with them all the agrarian knowledge and survival traditions and just like this deep desire to connect with the land and grow their own food. And so this whole, when we talk about you know, local sustainable food systems, you know, that was what I was immersed in as a child because most of the people in their neighborhood, the black, um, older black folks, you know, who came from the rural South and migrated to the urban South, like they had a similar ethos. And so my grandfather didn't have a garden. He had an urban farm in his backyard. And I mean, every literal inch of space was being used to grow food and he had chickens and he had hogs in a backyard, in a city. And most of the neighbors had some type of similar kind of like contribution to the local food system, whether it was just growing tomatoes on pots on their front porch or cultivating mini orchards in their backyard. And it really saddened me to go back to that community now and see that it's like a shell of itself. And statistically, I know that the community that they lived in has some of the highest rates of preventable diet-related illnesses, heart disease, type of 2 diabetes, certain cancers. And so when I do this work, I feel like this is a, a, the practice for me is remembering, piecing back these histories of our communities actually holding space in this way. You know, there's, there's so many ways that black communities are shamed and blamed for the problems that we have and, and without a recognition of the structural forces that have brought them to this point. And so when I think about everything that I know, I, you know, I have to credit my grandparents. Um, but in terms of my desire to commit to working on these issues, it started when I was in a doctoral program and I was talking about it yesterday. I was combing through archives, looking at these old Black Panther newspapers, and I learned about the Oakland Community School that Erica ran. I learned more about the free, the free breakfast for children program, the grocery giveaways, in which Bobby Seale said everybody would have a, what do you say, a whole chicken a chicken in every bag. A chicken in every bag. And, you know, fresh like produce. That's like, you gotta go find those chickens. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna get in that. But the point is, they were feeding people. They were feeding thousands of poor people throughout the Bay Area. And I 
you know, it was one of those moments where I um, was so impressed by their kind of forward thinking and cutting edge analysis that understood this intersection of poverty and malnutrition and institutional racism. And I think we have these images of what hunger looks like, right? These kind of like constructed images of people in sub-Saharan Africa with distended bellies and, you know, um, all that crazy, you know, what's her name? The Sally, Sally, Struthers. Sally Struthers, that whole um, genre. Um, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so what I quickly learned is that we were among young people who were starving. You know, they were, as, as, as Raj Patel would say, stuffed and starved. And I would see these young people, and I, and, and I always, you know, I talk about this moment a lot because I remember it so vividly. Being on the subway, leaving Brooklyn to go to Manhattan for campus, and seeing these kids on the train at 7 o'clock in the morning eating Red Hot Cheetos and candy bars and, and um, drinking sugary drinks, sodas, and energy drinks, and um, what do you call it? Um, whatever, these oversweetened sugary beverages. And so I thought to myself, you know, having done this research and thinking about the work that the Panthers were doing, I was like, these children are malnourished. Like they're not eating food. They're eating, as Michael Pollan would say, edible food-like substances that are high in fat, high in sugar, and high in salt. And how can you learn? How can you learn when you're going to school in that way? I mean, the, the Panthers started the Breakfast Children the breakfast program because before they were in empirical studies, they knew that there was a connection between academic outcomes and nutrition. Education, you know, the educational outcomes, behavioral outcomes, so much of that is connected to what we eat or just being able to have a nourishing breakfast. And so I started this organization because I really wanted to help young people feel empowered not only just to kind of reinvent their relationship with food, but to think about how they could be agents of change in their communities. And it was, it was challenging because we had to go through a process of like recalibrating their palates. You know, they were so used to eating all this crappy food that we had to help them appreciate real food again. And once they did that, after a year or nine months of us just like doing visits to urban farms and community gardens and taking them back to the center and having them cook the food that they harvested or that we got, and then them trying things that they never would try in any other circumstance because they harvested it or because they chose it, then they slowly began to kind of reinvent the, their relationship with food. And so we brought them back for a second year where we did more advanced training on political education and community organizing and peer education. And we would partner with other groups who were like doing urban farming and other types of food systems work. And we really want to bring a more radical analysis because we knew that it wasn't the fault of these young people that they didn't have access to healthy, fresh, affordable food in their communities. And we knew that it wasn't their fault that their schools had such horrible lunches. And we really wanted them to be able to share that analysis and help to base build and organize so that the people in the communities can actually work for change. So. Um, the Panthers, my family, and my children. Um, I'll talk about them later. Um, I'll talk about all our children later, but I do have a lot of thoughts um, related to the book about ways in which we can actually be very proactive in helping our children cultivate uh, a love of vegetables and real food early on. And I think that means that so many of us have to reinvent our relationship with food, <laughs> but then um, we can pass it on and it works. It really does. Shane, thank you so much for both these framings and reframings of what it means to be from someplace and committed to someplace. And part of what I'm hearing reflected here is that the work that's happening now is not new, right? And we're so attuned to saying why things are going to be new and special and different that even though that's a strategy and we need those grant dollars and you know how to do, to do that register, we can sometimes confuse that with the work that we're doing, because I didn't hear, I wasn't hearing nonprofits speak here. I was hearing connection across time and generation. That's right. And that what it is, and thank you so much for bringing in land ancestors and contemporary indigenous struggle too, because many of the things that we imagine to be what's needed and new is actually what's been obliterated, erased, attempted to be genocided away, right? And so I think that also part of that is we also think about, um, you know, gender self-determination, right? As something that's very new. 
Yeah. Well, Savannah, but before we even move into that, I, I, Erica, I would love for you to just to share what you said. Is this kind of um, piggybacking on this whole idea of working within like the not-for-profit industrial complex? Erica, you, you talked about that yesterday, about just self-determination, doing for self, and, and not waiting on permission, and not even waiting on grants to really launch the important work that we need for our communities. So yesterday at the DM, how many of you were there yesterday? Anybody? Thank you for being there. And where's your name? I want to thank you again. You held it down. The Young Museum has people of color working for us. I'm sure that I'm sure that the young has probably seen the most black people they've seen in like decades because of this whole um, yes, Black Panther exhibition. <laughs> So, but the exhibit is worth, is worth your seeing, Soul of the Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power. And I want to, I, I love the exhibit so much, I've seen it five times in all its locations. And one of the things that are, is connected to what you just asked about is that these were artists who didn't wait for someone, a, a mentor or a sponsor, to say, yes, you may do art about black people and you may do it in this way. They just said, Afro-Cobra Collective said, hmm, we're gonna do our art. We're gonna show, there's some seats here if you'd like to come sit. Seriously, don't be shy. They're not here Thank you. Um, Does anybody else need a seat? Okay, so, um, where was I? <coughs> they were extraordinary, and I've had the great good fortune of meeting May and Wadsworth Gerald, um, who are in their 80s now. And when they talk about the Upper Cobra Collective, which Cobra means collective of badass revolutionary artists <laughs> and also black revolutionary artists. Um, they decided to do their work for each other and for community. And so they just did it. They didn't wait for permission. They didn't wait for a pile of money. They just did it. And to your point, Brian, that's what we did with the community survival programs. And by the way, the arts movement wasn't siloed over here. And then the other, the rest of the activists over there. We worked together. I can remember when somebody sold a big painting to get somebody out of jail on bail. So we saw that there was a need for health care in communities, and health care was not happening. So we called up all these doctors and dentists and specialists and said, we have a concept of the People's Free Medical Clinics. Could you come and work? Sure we will. They didn't get a penny, but they got loved for it. They got gratitude because there were people who didn't have access to healthcare living right down the block from us everywhere, all over the United States. This isn't to say that that is a big way to do it, but everything we did in our community survival programs were models that could be replicated, and they have been. And some of the original 12 community, the people from medical clinics, still stand, right? So, and then when it came to education, we don't have access to education, as you said. It could, today we have not only private schools and what we call then parochial schools, but now we have um, alternatives to public school and charters and so on. But the Oakland Community School was created because we saw that children were not being loved. They weren't being seen, as you heard Keisha say yesterday, a student who was there yesterday who went to the Oakland Community School. She said that when she left Oakland Community School and went to a regular school, that was when she recognized that not all children were loved in their learning environment. So we just wanted them, the first thing we wanted was that for them to be loved and for them to be fed real food and 
for them to feel that they are of immense value in this world. And that's what they experienced. But we just did it. We didn't have any money. I was collecting a welfare check when I first started being the director. And I wasn't ashamed of it either. Because I didn't want to take any pennies from the school. And then we started to learn about grant writing. Wait, what? <laughs> you just put some words down there and you can get money for the oh, hmm. Well, let's learn how to do that. So we went to a grant writing workshop with Arnold Perkins. I don't know if you know him, but he is a force of nature. But he worked for the San Francisco Foundation and he said, basically, look at what their mission and purpose is, these funding agencies, and use their language and get the money. And so we did. We wrote grants and we were able to get from year to year that way, but we didn't. Ne we never took money. Where the caveat was, but you're, you'll have to shift your curriculum. No thank you, bye. And, or you'll have to work with the children. That they should wear uniforms. No thank you. Um, and so we we were very cutting edge because we were willing to go back to having no money rather than be pimped out like that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. That's not an academic statement, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it is theory. That, thank you, Savannah. That's right. It's theory. Well, I, I just want to say in that spirit, I felt so strongly that I wanted to do this work that addressed food inequity after learning about the um, work that the Panthers were doing. I just did it. Just you did know, it. I was working at a youth organization. It was a Manhattan-based organization. We gave uh, grants and technical assistance to youth organizations throughout New York. And so I had connections with all these organizations. And so I called people up and I said, listen, I want to do workshops with your young people about cooking. I want to do workshops about food systems. And I did it pro bono. And I just kept doing the work. You know, they say that if you do the work, the resources will follow, we hope. And I knew I, I had that faith that it would. And so for a year, I was just doing that stuff for free. No help, lugging equipment on the subway to Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn. And then, um, you know, we hired a development person who then wrote grants. And we were able to get grants and, and be sustainable. But if we would have waited to get money before we did anything, it wouldn't have happened. No. No. And we also worked really hard to undo the miseducation within our own hearts and minds and bodies as a staff. Um, if you worked at Oakland Community School, you had to work with you know, fresh eyes. Be open to uh, looking at what systemic racism does to all of us, not just some of us but all of us, and internalized racism. All of these things, they didn't have names then. There was no um, conceptual framework that we had. We just went at it and talked about it so that we would not greet one of those children that came to Oakland Community School in the way we were greeted. We would greet them with love. And they told us about this continually, but I can put that off. And I think that, I mean, we do, I think that just to follow this conversation talk more about kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how you were able to make love uh, even structural. How, what are the structures that create love in terms of what the open community school looked like? But also, part of what this conversation right now is making me think about also is how the political economy and economic conditions for black people in the Bay Area have shifted so much. That part of what you were talking about yesterday at the Young, and so... Um, just in the Bay Area? Well, this one, again, it, in the, I think the Bay Area, depending on how you count it, it has one of the highest um, housing burdens, right? So in terms of the amount of money that it costs just to keep a uh, roof over people's heads, depending on how you count it, within the 12 county Bay Area, two, like Santa Cruz County, San Francisco County, Alameda County, are some of the places where it's hardest to keep a roof over your head, compared to other places in the U.S., and certainly compared to um, like 30 years ago. So what you're saying just, just yesterday, um, was that for many folks who went into the Oakland Community School, they came from SFUSD, BUSD, OUSD, right. to huge right. cuts 
and some worked for free in order right. to be able to do this work. And so That's I right. think what I've seen just in my own community, um, the folks when I was working in the Oakland, Oakland Unified uh, School District in SFUSD in the early 2000s, some of the same folks that we did programming with, that were mentors with, that we ran programs with, who were doing work for free, are now doing that work out of RVs, are doing that work out of, uh, out of tents and campers, right? Um, Anita Dias is one of the most amazing youth workers now, and she's now an unhoused advocate because that model of work that she is very much a direct descendant of is literally untenable in the current Bay Area context. And so I say this because I also spent four years recently um, living in Louisiana and New Orleans, and that, you know, there's a lot to be said about, we can get into Louisiana if you want to, um, a lot to be said about systemic, it ain't benign neglect in Louisiana, right? This is systemic stripping of resources. Yes. And, and uh, how you can still rent a house for $600, right? And so people are making earrings, people are organizing, people are, are selling plates, having rent parties, and the level of social movement building that was, uh, was able to happen in that poor environment Right in the in the sense that there wasn't there isn't full employment people don't have jobs they're seasonal and we were organizing in the middle of the day we could have meetings that were four hours long we could provide childcare for each other in a non cash um, really power exchange based system that was first of all predicated on systemic poverty and de resourcing right and also is very outside of kind of coastal um, non profit spaces and so I, I think also just kind of talking about how the shifts in our ability to feed our children keep moves over our heads, and the professionalization of the nonprofit culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm just kind of saying how, how those things shift and shift how it becomes possible to continue in these ways, or we need to find new ways um, and new places to do this work, too. Yeah. I think we even need to have a new way in which we talk about food injustice or food apartheid, because I think with the housing crisis here, you know, it's a different situation when you're unhoused. I mean, this is like, people are having emergency food needs. People don't know where their next meal is coming from. And so, um, you know, I, I love that we're kind of moving away from this whole idea of um, food deserts and talking about food apartheid and the ways in which, you know, these systems have created conditions where people don't have access to healthy, fresh, affordable food. But, you know, I mean, we can't talk about food unless we talk about housing. We can't talk about food unless we talk about income. We can't talk about food unless we talk about land. And I, I feel like the Bay Area is the place where we can actually kind of like shift the way that we're th thinking and talking about, you know, food justice. Um, so just following on the Oakland Community School, and I'm, I'm really struck by the story of this uh, young person saying that love, not realizing that love was in short supply, you know, in some school space and some young people's lives. And so I think the reach of the Oakland Community School really can't be understated. Uh, it's created this global legacy. In London, there is the Erica Huggins Liberation School that has opened. Um, Right across the bridge, the, o the uh, OUSD Met West High School has opened the Erica Huggins campus, <laughs> a brand new school building that we did as a product of years and years of community organizing to open a new school building for young people doing um, in an alternative school. Um, and then even when I was at uh, Michigan State University last month, there's a young person who is writing an entire PhD dissertation on the specific models of black women's pedagogy that were innovated at the Open Community School. And so I think the way that we think about the ripples um, from your work are really powerful, but even for people who don't know the history, uh, in the SFUSD, uh, ethnic studies is not required to graduate. Soon it'll be required statewide, right? Uh, free breakfast is available for every low-income young person who goes to public school, and those things are all part of the legacy. Because we embarrass the federal government. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And they start feeding the children, and we said, fine, children get in bed. Now, that is something that people don't get, that what frightened the government, and they were very frightened of us, which is why you have gotten such misinformation about the Black Panther Party. I'm sorry you got all that. But we didn't have the, the resources to promote ourselves differently, but at the grassroots level, people knew that was all lies. J. Edgar Hoover in the memorandum said, I read this memorandum and I, I cried. He said, I'm not worried about them saying they want to defend their communities. 
It's those breakfast programs. Now think about what that meant and what their purpose was. It was to annihilate us and they did a pretty good job at that with taxpayers' money. Wait a minute, with my mother's money, my daddy's money. All of it, all of it. And it's very close to my heart because my husband was one of the people that the FBI killed. But what did you read in the Los Angeles Times? Two rival black groups. But it was shot each other and killed two men. But I have to say now, at UCLA, where they were killed, there is the, there were two men killed, John Huggins Jr. and Al Prentice Bunchy Carter, on January 17th, in 1969. All these years later, UCLA has just renamed its, um, a scholars program focused on social justice. It now is called the Carter Huggins Social Justice Scholars Program. Mm -hmm. So you see, it takes a while, and I'm, I'm saying that not just to tell a story, but to let you know if you're despairing about how long it all takes. It takes generations to shift things. And having lived seven generations by now, I, I know that change will come. It won't come before I close my eyes on this life, I don't think. But it's coming, and so we have to, we have to feed the little people. That wasn't the title of this event, though. <laughs> we have to feed the little people so they're, they're feeling empowered and strong enough to carry forward without burdening them with all of that. I don't mean to sound like I want to burden the children with something, but they were already asking questions like, why would somebody hate somebody because their skin is brown? What sense does that make, Erica? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense, I answer. But it exists. And so we have children who are wanting, your daughter said she wants to start a school. She's nine. That's so lovely. So we have our work to do, and it's about being honest without being totally somber. You always um, point out that food is one of the things that brings us joy. Now look at what enslaved Africans did with the little bit of food they had. Oh, man. And I know this because my mother is from North Carolina and was one of 11 children. I don't know how they put that, those meals together. I really don't understand, but they did because they didn't have much, but they had each other. So I think that um, all of this, all, uh, everything we're talking about is connected to everything. That might sound too circular, but I really, really mean it. There isn't anything that we could do that isn't needed. There's always something that we can do. And food is so essential to the human system. And it's such a powerful site for organizing. And I do, you know, one thing that I, I've underscored a lot lately is, you know, I think we can get so caught up in this reality that our community, so many people in our communities are sick and dying. And we know that it's directly related to what we eat, in addition to a number of other factors. But food is one of the things that is killing so many of us. And so what I've seen over the years, especially writing cookbooks that are plant-based and aimed at helping people think about eating more healthfully, is this kind of obsession with eating healthfully and seeing like food is this utilitarian thing where I need to like eat, you know, I need to figure out the micronutrients and nutrients I need to have so I can be healthy and, you know, somehow avoid getting these chronic illnesses that other people in my family have had. And I think it's important to be mindful of those things. And I don't I want us to remember that food is about community and joy and pleasure and like building, you know, just building around the table. And we could do that and we could you know, move into conversations about how do we organize and how do we base build to um, change these structures, but sometimes it's just about eating and having fun and That's connecting right. with the folks, and they don't have to be that serious, and so I really want people to remember that. 
So you said this piece, I think it's so important about the misinformation that people have about the Black Panther Party and really about the Black Liberation Movement um, writ large. Yes. And for me, because of fear. Mm -hmm. Well, fear and power mongering. It's also like, you know what I'm saying? It was a, a, it's a misinformation campaign. And so for me, I first learned about your work through reading Elaine Brown's autobiography, A Taste of Power. Um, and so for me, I was 14 years old when I read it. And so this was my first big text. I was like, oh, okay, the Black Panther Party was run by black women, and it was sustained by the vision and the labor of black women. And when I started talking to other people, I realized that that was not everyone's they looked at you understand like you, it. You are from the planet right. Right. Yeah. They, they literally would quote to me Kwame Ture's quip that the only position for the women in the movement was, and so for those who don't, for those who don't know, y'all familiar with what I'm talking about? I mean, it's a different generation people who don't know, so I'm just telling. So there is a clip from Kwame Ture, former Sophie Carmichael, worked with the SCLC, that the only position for black women in the movement was prone or lying down, right? Which I think is indicative of certain kinds of structural, um, not just obstacles, but structures of patriarchy that also were a part of um, black, uh, you know, this idea that male domination. And then this might seem like a totally different thing, but Brian, you're also bringing a conversation about liberation and justice into this fine food milieu and this cookbook market that is overwhelmingly dominated by white women, mm -hmm. right? And it seems like different things, but it's both ideas of which black bodies can be where doing what, <laughs> you know? And so I'm wondering if y'all can say a little bit about how gender has shaped how you show up, right? And, and the context in which you do your work and how you see gender in a notion of what black liberation and liberation for all of our earth looks like? Well, I, I want to start by, uh, that's a great question. I want to big up the, the women, the professors who help me understand gender and how it operates and just the different challenges um, and, and ways in which women are oppressed in our society. So, you know, professors like uh, Trisha Rose, Lisa Dugan, uh, Kathy Cohen, who was visiting from Yale my first year at NYU, and those are the women who really helped me understand gender. And you know, I, 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 so I want to talk about that, but I feel like even before I talk about that, I have to go back to my grandfather again. And my paternal grandfather, without knowing it, taught me a lot about gender. I mean, we I think we all know, or most of us should know, that kitchens can be very gendered spaces. You know, in the the, the home, the domestic sphere, it, what do they say? The kitchen's a woman's place or whatever, or at least they used to say that. And, um, you know, in the professional kitchens, they're very male-dominated, masculine, hyper-violent at times. And so, because my, um, matern my paternal grandmother had a, a massive stroke before I was born, I had only known her in a wheelchair, and my grandfather had to take care of all her needs. And so he did a lot of cooking, you know, in the South. I mean, yeah, man, barbecue. But my grandfather, he would talk to me about how he was teaching himself how to bake, teaching himself how to like cook these diverse dishes because he was the only person who was cooking. And I think that early on gave me permission to be in the kitchen and not feel any way about it. Because, you know, back then it was still kind of like, why are you in the kitchen making cupcakes? Or, you know, it was, there were people that your boys had feelings about you being in the kitchen too much, or my boys did. And so, but you know, given that my grandfather was a manly man, I mean, he hunted, he fished, and he kicked some ass. And knowing that he expressed love through food, and he really uh, was committed to not only cooking for his wife, but for the grandkids and the whole family. And it went beyond just throwing a pig on the um, grill. And so that was an important lesson to me. And you know, because of my understanding of the way that women are so, so oppressed and marginalized and exploited in the food industry, I've made it my mission to use my power and my platform and my position to help support women. And I mean, it's from, you know, the Be Healthy um, project that we started, you know, there were, most of our staff were women. And I did all I could to cultivate leadership and many of them have gone on to start their own amazing and brilliant food projects. Um, using this platform to support women. I mean, the first program that we had here under my residency was called Black Women, Food and Power. And we talked about the historical contemporary ways in which black women have uh, produced and distributed and consumed both food and food knowledge as scholars. And so, um, you know, I'm always thinking about the ways in which I can support women and, and, and non-gender performing folks too. We had a brilliant um, discussion 
with uh, Michael Twitty and Lazarus Lynch and Shannon Mustafir, and we were talking about uh, the issues that you know queer folks, gender nonconforming folks face in a mostly white male dominated um, food industry. You know, both in restaurants and the publishing industry. I will say that. If it weren't for middle class white women, I wouldn't have a career because before a lot of black black people discovered my work, white women were holding it down. So I will give up that. Uh, big up to y'all. But uh, <laughs> And I will pick up my agent, Danielle Svetkov, <laughs> a middle class white woman. <laughs> hey, Danielle. <laughs> I'm sure there's so many names I want to say. Where, are you, where, where should I begin? Well, I love what you were saying before. I, I, you, were, you were taking us on this, this gender sovereignty place of where you were say, sensing yourself showing up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was showing up everywhere. And then I didn't have anybody to talk to about it. I'm so grateful that we live in a world where right now, young girls and young boys can go somewhere. I hope they do, uh, because it isn't always easy to do so. But there was literally nowhere that I felt I could be seen. I had one friend. Um, who's, like her mantra was, oh, Erica, no, you didn't say that. <laughs> but she would listen to me. She didn't have judgment. She would just, I would tell her how I felt about something or someone, for that matter. And she would say, well, yeah, last week it was a boy. Is a girl now? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And, but I didn't understand that this, I understood it wasn't appreciated. But I didn't understand that there were ugly names for it right away. So I kind of kept to myself. I was kind of a loner. I kept to myself and I just kept my feelings to myself. But I, I just feel like that's so unhealthy for a human being to suppress anything. And then um, right along with that, I was very, very tall, as I said. And... Um, and I was teased for that. And then skin color in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. was one of the places that had brown paper bags at the doors, the churches, and combs at the door. You could only get in if. And I think that what I started to feel is that there has to be a way that we can bring our entire selves into any room. And when I was teaching, I made sure that my st the students in my care felt that way. At Oakland Community School, that was at the base of what we felt um, about the children. We wanted them to be. We didn't want them to do. We wanted them to be, and that was how they felt. They felt love, like I'm sure that your grandmother felt, because her husband was taking care of her. We just wanted the children to feel cared for in a very specific, active way. Not just, oh, we love you because you're little black and brown kids. No, we're going to give you healthy food. But when we opened the school doors, the school had a history before it opened in East Oakland at an old church space. And it had another name. We all understand that, he said. And he was right. We wanted to name people could remember Oakland Community School. And um, we couldn't, even, by the way, black people couldn't get a loan to buy a commercial building at that time. So some of our friends who were friends of the Panthers and they were white, they got the loan for that building. So I just want to state clearly that as we talk about being people of color, we're not or white supremacy, we're not talking about, we're not dismissing people who do wonderful work in this world on behalf of everyone. It doesn't matter what their color is, but it does matter what work they do inside their hearts. That matters. 
So anyway, at that school, I'll tell you that one, um, one particular student stands out in my mind because she came into my office many, I kept the door open. And this particular day, her name was April, let's call her that. And um, she came in my office and she said, I need to, I need to bleach my skin. Now this wasn't a thing then, as it is now. And so I said, so why don't you have a seat? Let's talk about this. And she said, I'm just too black. She said, but Erica, if I bleach my skin, now I have to bleach my eyebrows too, won't I? And the hair on my arms. And I didn't, I wasn't reactive, I just listened. I said, April, do you realize how beautiful you are? She said, no, I'm the ugliest thing walking, look at me. I said, I used to feel that way about myself because I wasn't brown like you. She said, you did? I said, yeah. Now we call that thing, what's it called? Proximity to whiteness. But I talk, I talked to, I talked to April about the beauty of her skin. She was only 11. And I wondered what had happened to make her feel that way. She didn't start at Oakland Community School as a little two and a half year old. She started later on. Hey, Matt. And, um, but isn't that striking? And then the next time she came in the office, she goes, Erica, okay, I'm not gonna bleach my skin. She said, but I got a friend, and she really wasn't talking about herself. She said, I got a friend who thinks she likes girls. Can I send her in the office? I said, sure, send her in. We have so many rules we've been taught are beneficial that are harmful. All these rules that are given us about how humans behave and where men go, where don't go, where women go or don't go. And so in the Black Panther Party, women ran it. But there is a gendered reason for it. The police were trained in this institutional sexist world institutionalized sexism. So the police were trained to believe you arrest the men, they're the ones. So there we were. The men were being killed and arrested continually, every day, everywhere that the Black Panther Party was at work. But also, and even before that, the Black Panther Party drew women who were very much about being change agents. Not just activists, but transformers. And so, um, so when the men were being arrested and killed, the women just stepped up, as we do. That's what women do. And um, when I first was studying um, for a master's program, I read about women and gender and work, women's work. I thought, mm. My mother didn't have the opportunity to choose what kind of work she was going to do. I don't quite understand this, but I started understanding it through a sociological perspective. It really helped me to understand how things work. So at any rate, at the school, going back to the school, we were there for the children because nobody was there for us, or the people who were there didn't quite, no way had been carved yet for the conversations we wanted to have. But since we were trailblazers, all of us, we were open to the conversations that girls and boys wanted to have with us. And we always used the term, when they came to us with a question, can you investigate? And if you had, <coughs> what did you find in your investigate? Or did, did you investigate? So we were te teaching critical thinking skills before Four, that was a term. And, and my point is that all of this that I'm saying isn't, isn't just Oakland Community School. It is what we all can do. We can undo 
those harmful notions about ourselves and others and walk in the world <coughs> at least that much free. Erica, I want to say there was something that was striking about the film yesterday. So yesterday um, at the, the De Young, uh, we screened a film that LeVar Burton did in the 1970s that featured the Oakland Community School. And I know it was just a snapshot. Do you guys want to come in? I think there's, there's more seats here. Seats here? Yeah. yeah. Don't be shy. So anyway, um, I know it's a snapshot, but it, it seemed like the girls at the school were, I mean, I mean, they were strong, yes. and they were very well-spoken and outspoken, and it seemed like they had a lot of leadership yes, roles they that they were afforded. I mean, with the girl who was being interviewed throughout the film by Huey Newton, the young woman who was in the, um, the Justice The Justice Board. The Justice this Board. This is our alternative to detention. Yeah. The children met with children about what things they could do to change behavior. So I was just wondering, outside of modeling, obviously, with a lot of the, the strong women who were teaching at the school and helping to run the school, um, were there efforts that you made to particularly kind of help develop leadership in girls and ensure that they were being elevated? Not specifically, but in the classroom, if, if the boys were... Um, if the boys brought this imbalance, we worked with it. And, and that's the kind of thing we did everywhere. If there was an imbalance, we worked with it. If, if, and I don't mean at the level of bullying, just with the instruction of, you know, boys learn very early on that they can, they can enter rooms in a different way than girls. Nobody has to tell them, right? It, um, in families, boys learn that they can stay out at night longer than their sisters without a big conversation about it. But what we did was, was to have a conversation about it. Hmm. Why did the boys in the classroom um, laugh when that girl spoke? She, she, was speaking, she was speaking from her experience and she was saying what was true for her. Why did you laugh? Silence, but then we would have a discussion about it. So we didn't, we didn't make anybody wrong or bad. We just asked them pertinent questions, and then we also worked with families, so the families understood that we appreciated their daughters as much as their sons, which made the parents, especially the moms, um, think about, wow, you're giving my kids something I never had. Nobody listened to me. I wanted to be a doctor, but my brother was the one who was encouraged to go on to school. So, and so, um, sitting here. Oh, well, one of the things we talked about uh, was well, this, this, one of the things that was so <laughs> wonderful coming out of our conversation was that all the things that happened to Oakland Community School. Yes, Oakland Community School closed in eighty two, eighty three. And the work that you've done with young people has continued on and so and on, and you've worked actually with thousands of young people in the state of California, right? Yes. And so um, we wanted to give us a chance to actually experience some of the work that um, Erica has done. And so there's an activity that Erica's going to share with us uh, that really connects a lot of the things yeah. we're talking about around food, um, uh, mindfulness, and really this idea of we don't want kids to just do, we want them to be. Right? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so um, decades after I worked with, we taught um, the children at Open Community School were taught meditation. When I formally began a practice of meditation in prison, um, I carried it forward into my community days. But then, and so, the children at Oakland Community School would gather in our multi-purpose room after lunch every day and sit still and breathe for like three to five minutes. That's all it was. And there's some little people over here who may need something. And, um, and then I, in the 1990s, I ended up working for a Harvard Medical School affiliate called the Mind Body Medical Institute 
long name, but simply it meant our bodies and our minds are always in conversation. Always. Always. Right now. You, your mind and body are talking about something. When are they done? When are they going to stop talking? Um, <laughs> what's this exercise? And they, I went into the public schools all over the state of California and also in parts of the East Coast. And I taught relaxation to public school educators. That's what we called it. Resiliency skills for educators, but also relaxation in the classrooms to students. And one of the ways we knew that we could make mindfulness, as it is called, um, in its purest state, the way we could make it make sense for little children is that we could use food. So in one of the schools in Berkeley, you're receiving a raisin. One raisin, okay? Not a pile of raisins, just one. And you'll see why in a minute. And we found out that the children didn't understand how to slow down, except during the time that we were sitting for breathing and closing our eyes and being quiet. Then they understood. So we gave, don't eat the raisin yet. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's part of it. Um, if you ate it, it's okay though. <laughs> I'm sure the universe won't dissolve back into the cosmos. <laughs> you can, you can um, get another raisin if you ate it already. So we asked the children, in this one middle school that was called Horace Mann <laughs> in Los Angeles to um, do a mindful practice and that was to go home and eat their meal chew their food how about that rather than inhaling it um, and one girl came back and said her mother said who are you and what have you done with my daughter? <laughs> because she was eating slowly and digesting her food and she could explain to her mother that her mother started drinking. So at another school, we decided to give the children one raisin. And I'm trying to take the time so everybody has a raisin. Does everybody have a raisin? No, no. <laughs> what was it? Did we run out of raisins? It's just the serving. The brown napkin. Oh, well, you can take that one raisin in your hand. And then you're responsible for the sanitary area. So, this, how close are we to everybody having a raisin? Where do you have you don't have a raisin? Don't have a raisin, raise your hand. Okay, cool. We're almost there. So here's what's going to happen. In a minute, you're going to put the raisin in your mouth. You're not going to chew it. You're not going to swallow it. You're going to put it in your mouth. This is what the children did. If the children had patience to do this, I know you can do it. I believe in you. So just put it in your mouth and let it sit there. And you want to become mindful of that little raisin. By that, I mean... You want to be aware of it in your mouth and what sensations it's causing. What happens after it sits there for a while? Does it keep its shape or does it have another shape? Don't chew it, don't swallow it. I know we're so used to sort of like with food. So, how many people are finding that the raisin is getting plumper as it sits in your mouth? Mm -hmm. You can roll it around in your mouth. Is it plain like it was when you first put it in your mouth or is it 
kind of sweet. What's the skin like? Is one little raisin. Now when you like slowly, you can begin to chew it. But slowly. <coughs> There's no hurry. What did you find when you first bit into it? And what is it like now as you're chewing? And you want to ch fully chew it until it's some kind of liquid. It's just you and the raisin. And then when it's fully liquid, you can swallow it. And all the while, you're taking the time to breathe as you do this little exercise. The sixth graders in Horace Mann Middle School became quiet like you. So can we ask what happened? Did you do it too, Sam? Wow. Did you notice something different in the room, by the way? What happened that you did like this? Yeah. Yeah. So imagine that in Horace Mann Middle School in South Central Los Angeles, the sixth graders at their little raggedy desks did this. And so but what was your experience? Just shout something out. When you first... Sweeter. Sweeter. Yeah. Juicy. Juicy. What else? Soft. Gone? <laughs> Soft. What? Soft. Soft. But the shrivelly skin plumped up, didn't it? A tingling sensation? Mm. Gratitude. With a little raisin. <laughs> Mouth water, yes, a lot of the children said that. And some of the children told me that they never knew that anything real was sweet. Isn't that interesting? What else? What what else happened when you were chewing it? Satiating. I'm shocked at how satiating. It's one. satiating. One little raisin made you feel kind of full, right? Yeah, it's like um, a, a study was done in the Himalaya Mountains and another mountain region in Europe, and where the elders who had become somewhere between 110 and 120 years old, when asked why they live so long, you know what they said? We chew our food. <laughs> Isn't that something? What else? Anything else happen? Jessica, what happened? Uh huh. Anything? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we don't have a mic, so for you, so I don't want you to have to shout. But we had alternatives to raisins. Mm -hmm. Do you want an alternative? Yeah, here it comes. And then I'll call back on you. Who is it? It made me want to check out what other people's experiences were with their raisins. That's right. It made me connect to my neighbors. It was a connection to your neighbors. You wanted to talk about it. And that's what the children did. So now we have to move on, but you could do this at your next meal. You know, you could do this in your family. You could teach this to your children. It's so simple, but I don't, I don't mean teach in a very kind of, you got to do this kind of way. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Absolutely. And community member, what's your name who said about connection to people? David. 
they, what David was just saying about this one, and this, this kind of reaching out to each other and the sense of wanting to connect with each other, this is usually the time when there's like a Q and A, right? Where the, you know, the audience poses questions for us up here to answer as experts. But for me, as a black feminist anthropologist, I know that we're all experts of our own experience, right? So instead of a and a we want to have an A and Q, right? <laughs> so we have some questions for you all um, to really share your expertise and your um, contributions to this conversation. And one of them is really about, you know, where do you see the legacies of the Oakland Community School and the other 64 survival, survival programs of the Black Panther Party showing up? in your community, in your work. So that's one piece. Think about that. You see those legacies happening. And the other piece um, is really about your experience of living, working, organizing, surviving, eating in the Bay Area and what it means to be in this place and feed your people. Are your people nourished, right? What, what would it mean for your people to be nourished in this context? And so we invite conversation uh, in reflection of those two questions or any other any other offerings that you want to put on this buffet that's been so beautifully laid by Brian and Erica. And will there be a microphone for people? You can come up and please, we, we really want people to have the courage to do this because we're clear that this audience is replete with educators and activists and organizers and folks who really can offer something because it's really about offering this as something that everyone in the room can consume. So come. Edit, edit. Because I'm going to start calling people out. Oh, before we start calling people out, it's an educator on the stage, and so Erica has been given remix. So those are the two questions. Pick for yourself which one you want to speak to in your mind. So one is about, uh, one's about the legacy of the programs. One's about what it means to be nourished in the Bay Area. Just in your mind, pick which one is on your heart. Now turn to your partner, and we're all going to have a moment to share uh, with your partner. So you really want to have a partner. So find one person. So that means some of the folks, community member with the, with the lovely partner, have to look behind them. One person. Find your person. My students are in the building. When you find your person, make a hat. Taylor, I see you. Make a hat. If you find your person, make a little hat. Make a hat like this. You like a hat? Red hat? Make a hat. Okay, someone's hat is called. Someone's hat is one person. One person. Whose head is uncovered? Who, does, who needs a beanie? Who doesn't have a hat? This community member needs a partner. <laughs> so with this person with the lovely sea foam sweater, sea foam, meet polka dot. Who else needs a partner? I see you. Glasses, you have a partner? Okay. All right. Between the two partners, observe. The person with the shorter hair will listen first. So the person with the longer hair, go ahead and share. <laughs> for your contribution to this conversation. Again, our community, me community members of Polka Dots asked us for our questions. One, where do you see the legacy of the 65 survival programs of the Black Panther Party showing up in your work in your community? Number two, what does it mean to be nourished? What does it mean to keep the people in the Bay Area context right now? Are you and your folks getting nourished? Short hair person, let's continue on and then we'll have a moment for some of us to reflect out and go.
one hand on your head. If you hear me, the other hand on your head. If you hear me, break it out. Before we close, would one or two people like to just share anything that's on their heart right now to contribute from their conversation or from their experience? And we have a microphone, I think. Yeah. It's not wireless. And there's somebody over here. And another one starter. Hi, um, so I was sharing about how I'm a teaching artist um, in OUSD uh -huh. and how just really I have not been feeling very connected to some of the things. Um, and so like hearing about the Oakland Community School really kind of made me feel like some of the things that are on my heart, some of the things that are bothering me, I should kind of stick to that feeling and kind of like try to connect some of those ideas that I have for how better we can kind of bring kids to make them feel secure in their own kind of like being in the world and kind of tie that together. So thank you. That was like one big thing that I was thinking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, thank you so much. So good to hear from you. Um, you know, I, I just actually learned about some of the incredible reforms in education in Philadelphia. And I think and they, they sounded so much like a continuation of the legacy that you're talking about and uh, Black Panther programs. And so aligned with it. And what they were saying in Philadelphia is like they were able to win, you know, more dignity in public schools across the city and more resources addressing all the things that you talked about, in part because of the mass wave of teacher strikes around the country. And so, and, and I would imagine in other cities too, probably when the teachers and when the community looked at, oh wow, there's this huge power shift, what should we be asking for? What is the beautiful tomorrow? They really tapped into very similar um, remedies that started from the Panthers. And so I saw that really clearly in Philadelphia, and I'm sure other cities that are coming off of incredible teacher organizing power will be able to have the same reforms and continue it on a national scale. If you're in the back half of the room, can I encourage you to come, come forward so I can get the mic to you? And if anybody wants to donate a new AV system to us. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I was late. It was my wife and my kid. It's okay. Um, so I caught, I caught some of the conversation, uh, of course, halfway or whatnot. Uh, so I'm from South, Cape Town, South Africa, and there's something that you mentioned about, you know, J. Edgar Hoover regarding the breakfast program. You know, his biggest qualm was the breakfast program more than anything else. Um, you know, this whole the issue with food and nutrition that I, you know, even yesterday and this morning I was thinking about it, is that in South Africa it's very, there's a thing with black food and white food, right? Mm -hmm. like, so the healthier the food is, the whiter it is, and the more expensive it becomes, mm -hmm. right? Um, so so we flooded with KFC and McDonald's, so I was flooded with that. So in fact, when you go into a store, you know, like your your whole nuts and, and your wheat and so forth, the prices are exorbitant. So immediately you walk in and you know, ah, this is not for us, this is for the white folks, you know, the healthy food. But what's interesting is that when it comes to food and health, our ancestors have been teaching us about food and health right. without these prices. Right. You know, so it's always fascinating to us how this information and, uh, you know, and this health gets repackaged mm -hmm. and sold back to us. Right. You know? um, so, and then linking that with what you said, you know, J. Edgar Hoover's biggest qualm was, you know, the food program. So in South Africa, there's, there's this resurgence, well, not resurgence, but there's this, our issue if, is, is the land, right? Getting the land back. So that influences the votes, and who becomes president and whatnot. The biggest thing we facing is, is okay, well, if, 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 if the economic freedom fighters, you know, who are so-called militant in South Africa, if they win, right, then we're going to get the land back from the white folks. Right. The biggest problem is what? Is the white folks are the ones who own the farms, mm -hmm. which is the food. Mm -hmm. So we're saying like, shit, mm -hmm. if we take the land back, how are we going to provide food? Because we don't, we're not taught how to grow food. And then in agriculture, you know, agriculture 
schools are for white folks. You know, so we looking at them like, what, do you want to become a farmer? What, man? Because that's, that's not sexy, right? Becoming a farmer is not a sexy thing. <laughs> but you don't know how to grow food. But then you want the land back. But, you know, so, so it's a very, that's the reason why I came here today, like, she's because of these topics and conversations. Thank you. you know, so thank you for that. And I mean, I've only been here for five months in San Francisco. It's very much like Cape Town, South Africa. It's segregated. Yeah. <laughs> very segregated. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary, actually. Cause I'm like, am I going to get shot? And like, it's very segregated, you know? Um, and just the food you guys have here, it's, 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 it's very expensive. It's very, even your simple, your simple food is very expensive. It's very, but it's fashionable. Very, 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 very fashionable. And then, you know, so it's very interesting. I thank you so much. I just thought I should just, contribute that and uh, 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 yeah, I'd like to come to more of these talks. I think it's very important that people get this information. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Awesome. I just I wanted to say one thing. One of, one of the things that, and and our friend, what's your name? My name is Sia. Sia, thank Sia. you. Um, one of the things that Sia reminded me of is that at Oakland Community School, it was community-based child-centered, tuition-free. That means that those three healthy meals a day, no mother or father or grandmother or grandfather had to come out of pocket. Food should not be treated as a privilege. So I just wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. I should. Raise your hand if you're feeling fed right now. Woo. I know, I am. And so, um, Brian opened our space with so much intention and grace, really in terms of how you set, not just set the table, but how you set yourself, right? And how you um, come into cooking and come into this space with intention. And we wanna move out in the same way. Because a lot of times we're leaving out of a space, we kind of, we, train, we don't ever take our, our time to transition out, right? We say grace at the beginning of the meal and you chat your way to making dishes on the way out, right? And so uh, in, any, in any space where there's food happening, there's digestion. And digestion is about separating out what your body needs right now and what we're gonna let go. And we're gonna do that same moment right now, take a couple of mindfulness moments to digest. So I invite you to release what's ever in your hands right now, um, to set your feet in a way that feels comfortable and stable. And let's take a couple moments to do some spirit digestion. So allowing your eyes to go soft or close as you feel. And take a deep breath in through your nose, but allow it to go all the way down your spine into your belly, and then release that out. Being in the presence of all of the wisdom that Erica and Brian have, and that our community members have served today, allow what is going to serve you to rise up. The gems that are gonna nourish you. And come back in um, into the room and we're gonna just go on ahead and, and shake the rest off like this. So taking three breaths, raise your hands up on one breath and shake off anything you don't need from this room. Just literally uh, brush your shoulders off, okay? And take it, brush it right on off. One more time, breathing in. Anything you don't need off the head, off the shoulder. And the last one, bring to mind that nugget, that nourishment, bringing it up and bringing that one in to the belly. May we all be nourished and fed. So, does anybody have a copy of my new book? Yeah. That I can borrow? Okay. Um, I, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the book a little bit um, because this is kind of one of the major pull factors of this event. Um, can I quickly read the introduction yes, to people? Because yes. I want to give you guys a sense of just the uh, thrust behind this book, so I'm not going to take too much of your time. It's the prettiest book in the world. Five P, five P, five P. So um, the, the title is, of the introduction is Fennel for Zinzi. Zinzi is my uh, youngest daughter. Uh, we named her after um, Miriam Makeba. Her um, name is Zinzi Le. Her is Zinzi. A vegetable kingdom is inspired by my daughters. <coughs> Hold on a second. Savannah had me upstairs doing voice <coughs> <laughs> Vegetable Kingdom is inspired by my daughters, Mila and Zinzi. 
They have blessed this book like my ancestors blessed meals by humbling me to that which is greater than myself. When Mila pulls a gloriously resonant hum out of her cello, and when Zinzi dances in energetic spins and wild flourishes, they are turning the love and effort I pour into them into a vitality and power that they will carry far beyond what I could ever know. I wrote this book to make a diversity of foods of the plant kingdom irresistible to them, to inspire their curiosity, and to show them the pleasure of a lifelong adventure with good, nourishing food. That mission drives this book. Vegetable Kingdom reflects the essence of how my wife, Jadon, and I root and raise our children. Mila and Zenzi have been rooted in the garden with farm fresh ingredients and raised <clears throat> ingredients and raised on a diversity of dishes springing from the deep well of black and Asian foodways. We help shape their multicultural identity organically by creating and consuming Afro-Asian food and the spectrum of flavors they engage, often in the same meal. While I emphasize ingredients, cooking techniques, and classic dishes of the African diaspora, Jadon does the same with Asian food, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese. So this book features a number of ingredients and flavors from East and Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, and the American South. With such, a, with such an expanse of cultural ground to cover, it is serendipitous that it would be, it was the Mediterranean, a region at the crossroads of Africa, Asia, and Europe, and one of its heartiest vegetables, fennel, that acted, as a catalog, <coughs> that acted as a catalyst for unifying the dynamic spirit and energy that permeates this book. A few years ago, I was at the farmer's market checking out the late summer, early fall bounty, flavorful seascape strawberries, fresh cranberry shelling beans, vibrant red burgundy okra, and plump pomegranates, to name a few. That morning, fennel was all over the place. The bulbs glowed bright white, the stalks and fronds were moist and fresh, and their anise-like aroma was strong. One stand offered samples of crunchy sweet slices with fresh lemon juice squeezed over them. I had never really bought fennel unless a recipe required it, but that day, the fennel was calling me. Your boy bought four bunches. <laughs> On the strength of that smorgasbord for the senses. Driving home, I decided I would use every part of the fennel. I envisioned the feathery fronds as a garnish, flashing back to Instagram photos of some of my favorite chefs, creatively balancing color and making dishes pop by arranging fresh herbs, microgreens, and citrus zest on top of them. I figured I would put the fennel stems in the freezer along with other vegetables, scraps reserved for stocks. I had no idea how I would cook the bowl that day, even though it was it is the only part I really used in the past. Regardless of how I prepared the fennel, I was a little nervous that Zinzi, my five-year-old, would not be into it. Mila, my eight-year-old, has always had an adventurous palate. She loves to try different cuisines and takes pride in eating unfamiliar dishes. Zinzi, on the other hand, would be happy if she had pasta, bread, and crackers at every meal. <laughs> My other goal was to create a dish through the lens of the African diaspora. Inspired by visual artists Romare Bearden, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Deborah Roberts, and Derek Adams, as well as some of my favorite hip-hop producers like Prince Paul, The Bomb Squad, DJ Premier, RZA, Organized Noise, and Mad Lib. <coughs> I have approached recipe development as a collagist, curating, cutting, pasting, and remixing staple ingredients, cooking techniques, and traditional black dishes popular throughout the world to make my own signature recipes. But this approach is bigger than creating cookbooks. Many people build altars, visit grave sites, and reminisce with photos to engage with loved ones who have passed. For me, recipe creation is a praxis where I honor and bring to life the teachings, traditional knowledge, and hospitality of my blood and spiritual ancestors by making food. While it may not be obvious, most recipes that I develop stand on the shoulders of relatives, mentors, historical heroes and heroines, and those who inhabited the land on which I live and work. Educating my girls about and introducing them to foods and flavors of the African diaspora allows me to teach history and share memories with them. It helps them learn about and take pride in the contributions of their ancestors, culinary and otherwise, and it celebrates foods of the African diaspora in a world where European cuisine is at the center and black food is often at the margins. So how did I blackify fennel, uh -huh. <laughs> use the entire vegetable, and create a recipe that even the most finicky eaters would enjoy? In my first pass, I pan seared it in olive oil, then basted it in a tangy citrus and garlic herb sauce inspired by mojo, a, con a condiment popular in Cuban cooking. It was solid, but something was missing. To bring more complexity and balance while building on the Afro-Caribbean theme, 
I thinly sliced some of the fennel stalks and added them to the sauce while simmering and basting the fennel. I also pulverized savory plantain chips in the spice grinder and sprinkled the powder on top before serving. Plantain powder is 2020. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> Um, that fennel was fire. <laughs> it even passed muster with my girls. As I nervously looked on during dinner, they were all smiles, and they couldn't get enough of that plantain powder. Turned out, freestyling an African diasporic inspired vegetable dish that kids enjoy was easier than I thought. Our girls tasted and proved most of the recipes in this book, so even if dishes don't appear to be quote unquote kid friendly, they are. In fact, I want real food to be seen as kid friendly. It incenses me when, I, when we eat at nice restaurants and the kid's menu is limited to hot dogs, fries, and chicken fingers, when it could flourish with millet, red lentil, and potato cakes, pan-seared summer squash sandwiches, and jerk tofu wrapped in collard leaves. We serve our girls whole food meals at home, but the idea that kids can't enjoy what adults eat is horribly reinforced when these menus bearing heavily processed crap and edible food-like substances are plopped in front of them as soon as they sit down. At home, I will often take the most obscure vegetables and prepare them in familiar ways so that Mila and Zinzi raise their food IQ and expand their palates. Throughout writing Vegetable Kingdom, I realized that this educational approach would apply to anyone. You may not have tried or heard of kohlrabi, but I promise you, you'll be hooked once you simply coal roast it and served it with a West African inspired peanut sauce garnished with peanuts, Fresno chilies, and lemon zest. Even the structure of Vegetable Kingdom was inspired by my daughters. I initially planned to organize a book around the four seasons as I mostly build meals with an eye on the beautiful seasonal produce growing in our home garden or piled on tables in farmer's markets throughout Northern California. But after Mila mentioned that her gardening class at school classifies vegetables according to which part of the plant is eaten, I decided to follow that structure for this book. Seeds, bulbs, stems, flowers, fruits, leaves, fungi, tubers, and roots. For vegetables that fall into multiple categories, I strive to use all parts of the plant. For example, beets offer their commonly used roots as well as, as well as their delicious edible leaves, which are often discarded. The literal vegetable kingdom is vast. This is just my snapshot. In this book, you'll find more than 175 recipes that bring out the best in more than 30 vegetables. I also share my favorite tools, tips, and ideas for cooking vegetables and building creative meals on your own. You can find most ingredients at a farmer's market or quality supermarket, but you might need to visit specialty grocery stores or order some ingredients online. It's worth it to get the full flavor of the recipe and to fall in love with vegetables, grains, or legumes you've never e eaten. My sincere hope is that this book affects real change in your world by inspiring your journey into the vast inverted pleasures of botanical bounty. If this book moves you to try new vegetables and to think more critically and creatively about how and what you eat, I will fulfill the calling to create this homage to help as learning and pleasure. Now go forth and explore Vegetable Kingdom. <laughs> So we're gonna uh, transition downstairs. I um, am so excited and honored that we were able to get one of my favorite local chefs, Chef Lala Harrison, to throw down. She developed a number, or she uh, recreated a number of recipes from the book. Uh, we'll have some drinks. Savannah and I will be signing books. Please say hi to Erica. Um, and please continue the conversation that we started up here downstairs. One more thing. We want you to be a member of this museum. And if, you're, if you can't join, if you can't become a member, I know it might be possible to visit for some folks, but please come back and visit us. You know, this museum, it depends on the members. It depends on the community. It depends on the people who can come here and support and ensure that these exhibitions can continue to time. I mean, we have Kwame Braithwaite upstairs. Do you know this brilliant photographer? Look. I want you to come downstairs and get a book, but I want you to go throughout the museum and check out these amazing exhibitions we have as well. So, thank you. We'll see you downstairs in a minute. Thank you all. Um, I do want to remind you to please fill out your survey um, before you leave. You can take it downstairs with you. And thank you all so much for this incredible conversation and enlightenment for all of us. Thank you.